Ya. Hmm. Oh. Ah, uh, a person obstructs others from doing charity, yeah. When he discourages that person uh, from doing charity, when he uh, talks bad about doing charity, uh, saying that it's useless, there is no good will come out of your doing uh, charity, and uh, when he encourages people not to do charity, uh, in those ways uh, he obstructs people from. Uh, uh, Practicing charity, so he will suffer in this very life and in the future life. So, like in the suttas, we find that the external ascetics, many of them were jealous of the Buddha because the Buddha became famous. So, because the Buddha and his monks were famous, they had a lot of offerings. Whereas external sect ascetics, uh, they did not practice so well, they did not keep good sila, they did not meditate well, they did not have wisdom. So they had little offerings. Uh. So because of jealousy, uh, they told the uh, people uh, that the Buddha always claims uh, that you should only uh, do uh, offerings, uh, uh, offer things only to the, the Buddha and his disciples. Uh. Don't offer to other other ascetics. But the Buddha said he, he doesn't do that because if a person does that, you obstruct others from doing charity, then you are doomed this life and the future life. You will suffer for it. And in fact, in one of the suttas, there's a general siha. He was a follower of the Nigantas or the Jains. And after he came to see the Buddha and talk to the Buddha, he converted converted and became a follower of the Buddha. Then the Buddha told him that uh, he should still do charity uh, towards these uh, nigantas. Uh, so he was very happy uh, that the Buddha uh, said that because he said that he heard the opposite, uh, that the Buddha said uh, that people should only do uh, offerings, make offerings to the Buddha and his disciples. Uh, uh, so... If a person uh, does charity, uh, the Buddha says uh, that uh, uh, that dana or that charity that we do uh, should not harm ourselves and should not harm others. Uh, so uh, you can advise that person uh, this uh, Dhamma teaching uh, of the Buddha, but you cannot tell that person not to give. Uh. <laughs> Some people uh, they are generous to the extent that they they overdo it. Nah. But actually, it's good for them. They, they have to suffer a bit. Nah. <laughs> but it's good for them because they will, uh, the reward nah, that will come to them nah, will be a lot. Nah. Uh, for example, the Buddha talked about one sutta because somebody asked the Buddha, if a person, say, for example, does business, nah, and then uh, he expects to get, for example, like a thousand just this example, a thousand dollars a month. There are various types of people. One type of person, when he does business, he expects to get one thousand dollars a month. He may feel miserably. He may not make any profit at all. Even his capital, also he might lose. In other words, he does not make even one one dollar. Or 
he makes a very small profit, like fifty dollars a month instead of the one thousand he expected, lah. And then on the other hand, there's another person, lah. He expects to make a thousand a month, lah. He might make less than that, lah. But say not too far away, lah, like eight hundred ringgit a month, okay, or five hundred ringgit a month, lah. That's the second one. The third one. He expects to make a thousand ring, a thousand dollars a month, ah, and he gets a thousand dollars a month, lah. Okay, and then the fourth one, although he expects one thousand, ah, he makes much more than that, lah. He might get five thousand or ten thousand instead of one thousand a month, lah. So this man wanted to wants the Buddha to explain why. The Buddha said, nah, it might be ah that this person, ah, uh, wanted to. Offer something to a virtuous monk, a virtuous ascetic, and the first time, ah, is he says he wants to offer something. Maybe he asks the monk, "What do you need?" lah, and the monk says he needs certain medicine or certain something, lah. And after saying that he wants to get something for that monk, ah, that ascetic, ah, he does not give anything. Uh, such a person, ah, uh, because ah, uh, he promised to give and he does not give anything, ah, uh, then in the future when he expects to make money, ah, uh, he feels miserably, lah, uh, does not get at all. Uh. That is the result uh, of making a promise and not uh, fulfilling it, lah. Uh. The second one, ah, uh, is the person, ah, uh, who promised to give a certain amount, say, of offerings, ah, uh, and then ah, uh, he gives less, lah, uh, than what he promised, lah. Uh. So the result is when he does business, he also gets less. Third one is he says he will give a certain amount and he gives exactly that amount. So he gets exactly what he expects to get. The fourth one, he says he wants to give something, then he gives much more. Lah. So he gets much more. Lah. So in this case, when you talk about this person, his financial situation is not too good. Lah. And he gives more than what he should give, lah. So next time, when karma comes back to him, ah, maybe in the future rebirth, or maybe even in this life later on, lah, he will get more than what he expects, lah. You know, sometimes when we give advice or so, we have to be very careful. We can give in such a way, but not obstruct him from from giving, lah. And not discourage him from giving also, because uh, if you obstruct him from giving or you discourage him from giving, you are creating bad karma. So what you can do is teach him the Dhamma. Lah. Tell him that the Buddha says, ah, when we do charity, it should not. Be to the extent when you when you, the giver suffers or he makes somebody else suffer, because there are many instances uh, in the Vinaya books. You know our Vinaya books uh, are like lawyers' uh, law cases, uh, <laughs> lawyers' uh, court cases, uh, because uh, there have been so many cases uh, of monks breaking the discipline. Uh, so many different types of cases. Uh, it's all come out into the Vinaya books. Uh, so, for example, uh, a person, uh, a monk, uh, in the Vinaya books, uh, he saw some some executioner uh, going to execute somebody uh, using the long sword. Uh, he's going to chop off his head. Uh. So, uh, one monk, uh, he maybe he saw somewhere else, uh, one executioner, uh, he. Chop somebody's head, na, but the head didn't. It, it was not a complete chop, lah. So this fellow chopped his head, and his head was hanging there. So you got to chop second time or third time, ah, before the head goes off, lah. So this busybody he thought he wanted to be more compassionate, na. He told the executioner, "You execute him one blow only, ah, one blow, chop off his head." So this executioner uh, chopped off the man's head with one blow. Lo. So when this was reported to the Buddha, the Buddha said, "Na, uh, is parajika. He's a party to the killing, ma. He's a party to the killing. He asked the, the executioner to execute him with one blow." <laughs> so you see, uh, so we have to be very careful, you know.
So in this case, like you want to help that person to tell him, uh, don't go beyond your means, lah. But if you word it in such a way, yeah, uh, then you are discouraging him from doing that, nah. Uh, you are creating bad karma. Uh. Yeah, that, that also when you tell your family member uh, to be selective uh, in their charity, uh, that they should only give to uh, organizations who are worthy uh, of receiving. Uh, also, you have to be very careful uh, because sometimes uh, we may not know the organization so well. Uh, so you can like tell that, 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 that family member to be careful. Uh, but you cannot tell him, like, you give to this one, don't give to that one, and all that now, because it might not be uh, making uh, the right decision. Mm. Unless the person asks you. Uh, uh, if the person asks you, then you get advice. Uh. Mm. Okay. Not necessary, la, because uh, like in the monastery, yeah, we try not to spend too much time cooking so that you have more time to practice one thing. Secondly, if you have many people in the kitchen cooking, uh, there's a, very often there's friction uh, that is not desirable. But if you say you want to give away something that was given to the monastery, yeah, it's best to consult, the, to get the okay from the abbot first. La. Instead of uh, on your own, uh, giving this away, giving that away, uh, you, you, you ask the abbot uh, for permission, then the abbot says, okay, then you give away, it's okay. Uh. Like sometimes we have too much uh, biscuits. Uh. So when the Ipo people come on Saturday, we give them a lot of biscuits to give to orphanage and all that. Uh. Mm. But with permission, uh, they don't uh, give away things without permission. You can tell them, la, you know, uh, we don't uh, guarantee uh, that uh, we will use it la, uh, if, if, they, if, they, if they ask. La. If they don't ask, then they just uh, forget what they say. La. Uh, it's up up to the the, the women folk uh, if they want to cook. But like this uh, guy who op offers organic veggie, yeah, uh, that is good stuff. So <laughs> good to keep. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Not easy to get organic veggie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Once you make that offering, or even you have the intention to offer already, you have the merit already. Mm. 
Not exactly, because sometimes you have to first thought, but you don't do it. <laughs> there are many steps la, to complete your charity, you see. So if you fulfill all the steps, la, then you get the full merit. La. But if you do halfway, then you get halfway merit. La. In the same way, like in the Vinaya books, la, when it comes to committing a theft, la, the Buddha said, la, for example, if a monk goes into another monk's room uh, to steal a uh, watch, for example, uh, the first intention he has uh, to steal, uh, that is already a small offense, small evil karma already. And then when he walks towards the room, uh, that is more uh, evil karma, but also small. Uh, then when he opens the door, goes into the room, uh, more evil karma. And when he touches the the, the the watch uh, to take it away, uh, that is more, uh, even more evil karma. But the theft is completed according to Vinaya when he lifts the watch uh, from the base, uh, from the table. Once you lift it up, uh, that is considered complete theft already. But for example, he touches the, the watch and uh, wants to lift it up, uh, suddenly he hears footsteps. Uh, uh, then he does not complete the theft. Uh, then he runs away. Uh. So that is not Parajika. Parajika is the, is the highest, uh, the heaviest penalty, uh, heaviest uh, offense uh, for a monk, uh, which uh, he has to disrobe. Uh. Uh, so in this case, uh, he has not completed. So every step along the way uh, is, uh, is, is contributes to that evil karma. Uh. So, like you had, you say you have the intention, that, but if you don't fulfill it, it's a very small uh, uh, karma. Not as a monk. Not as a monk. Once he has. Uh, broken the four parajikas. Huh? The four parajikas huh, are the heaviest offense for a monk. Lah. One, the first one is engaged in sexual intercourse. Second one is to steal lah, something of value. Lah. Something of value nowadays huh, would be in the Buddha's days, huh, was a certain amount of gold. Lah. So now we say like uh, uh, 20 US dollars or something. Uh, anything above 20 US dollars, lah, like uh, Hundred ringgit or something like that. Nah? Uh, if you intentionally steal, uh, that is a prajika. The third one is uh, killing a human being uh, or encouraging somebody else to uh, kill a human being. Uh, for example, advising a woman to have an abortion. Uh, that also is considered a, a, a prajika. You know? uh, and then the fourth one uh, is lying. Uh, that you have some super normal uh, attainment when you don't have, la. for example, lying that you have jhana when you don't have jhana, lying that you are an arya when you are not an arya, lying that you have psychic power. Uh, uh. So if a monk breaks any one of these four offenses, uh, he's no more considered a monk. La. Even though he refuses to disrobe, la, he's already uh, defeated. La. Uh, the English translation is defeated. The Chinese translation is like his head is chopped off already. La. I don't know what's the word. La. So, uh, if the Sangha knows, uh, the Sangha will force him to disrobe. Uh, but even if the Sangha does not know, uh, he himself knows, uh, inside is no more among. <laughs> You see, huh? teaching the Dhamma is one thing, practicing the Dhamma is another. A lot of people, they teach, huh? but they don't practice. Huh? The person who actually practices, huh? but whether he practices or not, you don't know. It takes some time to know. Huh? That also is hard to say whether they actually practice or not. Nah? We don't know. Nah? 
But if they really practice, then they can teach. Practice in the sense of... Uphold all the Buddha's teachings, lah. Sila, Samadhi, Panya. Arya has dreams, but probably not an Arahan. Because an Arahan has destroyed the Asavas. Asavas are uncontrolled mental outflows. Uncontrolled mental outflows where the, the, the consciousness flows without control. So dream state is a state where the consciousness flows without control. But in the Vinaya books, an Arahan has Sati 24 hours a day. Arahan has Sati 24 hours a day. So because of that, I don't think Arahan... Uh, even if Arahan, uh, the mind like dreams, uh, he will be aware, uh, he will know uh, that it's a dream. Uh. It's not like uh, ordinary people, uh, most people, uh, when we dream, uh, we don't realize that we are dreaming. Uh, we think it's a real state, uh, we get excited in the dream and all that. This uh, Asavas uh, is very interesting. Uh, that nowadays, uh, hardly any monk explains, you know. Hardly any monk explains. And you have so many meditation teachers uh, teaching meditation. And meditation is supposed to be the way to enlightenment. And what is enlightenment? Enlightenment in the suttas uh, is, this, is, is defined as destruction of the asavas. Destruction of the asavas. So my interpretation of asavas uh, is uncontrolled mental outflows. That means... Basically, uh, uncontrolled flow of consciousness. Uh. It is this flow of consciousness uh, which creates the world, uh, which creates samsara. Once consciousness flows, uh, then you see the world. The world exists for you. And in your conscious dream, uh, you see yourself in that, in that world. Uh. Just like when we dream at night. Uh. Whenever we dream at night, uh, you, you see yourself in the dream. Uh, right? Uh, so in the same way, when consciousness flows, uh, the world arises. Uh. So, this uh, tendency for consciousness to flow uh, is extremely strong. It's extremely strong. It is so strong uh, that when you don't do anything, uh, the mind starts to flow. It starts, you start to dream. You start to daydream. You start to think. Uh, sometimes fantasizing and all that. Uh, so, even at night, when you try to get some rest, uh, the mind will not give you proper rest. It will start to flow and make you dream and get excited and frightened and all that. So when we practice meditation, we are trying to discipline our mind, not allow it to flow. That's why we meditation, we train our mind to focus on one object. That is Satipatthana, intense state of recollection. Always bring it back to one object, always stay with one object. That's why the simile given uh, in the Satipatthana Sangyutta, later we will see uh, how to practice Satipatthana. The Buddha gave a simile of uh, the most beautiful girl of the land came out uh, and everybody clapped and shouted, uh, the most beautiful girl of the land. And they asked her to sing and dance. And then more people came, came out to see her. Uh, and then an ordinary person came along and he was caught, uh, caught by these villagers uh, and forced to carry a bowl of oil which was filled to the brim, filled to the top. And he was told that there's somebody walking behind him with an uplifted sword. If he spills the oil, even one drop of the oil, they will chop off his head. So he has to walk in between the crowd of people and he has to pay attention on the bowl of oil. So his, his mindfulness is on the bowl is one pointed attention cannot go elsewhere. He cannot afford to look left, look right. He cannot afford to look at the beautiful girl. He has to pay total attention on the bowl of oil. And that is the way to practice Satipatthana. If we can discipline our mind to contemplate on one object, for example, on Anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath, always pulling it back to the breath, then we are training our mind to stay with one object. And if our mind can stay with one object, then it cannot flow. Uh, we have stopped the tendency of the mind to flow. So if we always train our mind uh, to attain this state, uh, this state of one 
when your mind dwells on one object uh, without moving away, uh, it's one pointed attention, uh, one pointedness of mind, and that is called jhana. Jhana. Uh, the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. Uh. So, whenever we attain jhana, we are stopping the mind from flowing. That's why uh, the way out of samsara uh, is this is the way. Uh. If you cannot stop your mind from flowing even for a short while, you have absolutely no hope of uh, stopping this tendency of the mind to flow. That's why the Buddha says uh, that the steps to enlightenment uh, are the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana. There's uh, so many suttas. Uh, there's one sutta where the Buddha talk about the uh, coral, uh, coral tree, coral flower in the heavens, uh, how it blooms. And the Buddha talked about the various stages of the flower blooming uh, till it's fully bloom. And then the Buddha gave a simile uh, of a monk attaining the first jhana, second jhana, third, third fourth jhana, and finally enlightenment. Uh, so the Buddha always calls the jhanas uh, the footsteps of the Tathagata. Uh, that is the way out. And so if you can uh, train your mind uh, to abide in jhana, then you have stopped the asava from flowing. Uh, then there is a chance uh, of stopping the asava permanently. Uh, and then when, when the asavas, the, the, the tendency of the mind to flow, uh, this tendency, uh, not the flow itself, the tendency uh, is, is stopped completely. Uh, uh, then the person attains en enlightenment. Uh, so for an arahant, uh, it's not that he does not have consciousness, he still has consciousness, but it is controlled consciousness. If an arahant thinks, uh, it is controlled thinking. Uh, it is not uh, scattered thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but these uh, states are uh, um, quite unusual. Uh. Only thing is, uh, some of the states uh, we cannot trust completely. There are some people uh, in uh, certain states, uh, they can see heaven, they can see hell and all that. Uh. But sometimes it turns out to be imagination. So we can only trust the mind uh, when person is fully enlightened. So we have to be very careful. In the Hindu tradition, uh, once a person attains like jhana, the mind becomes bright. Uh, he's supposed to uh, go into seclusion for another 12 years. <laughs> uh, sometimes a person, uh, once you attain something, uh, you're too eager to go and uh, teach and all this thing. Uh, you cannot make progress. Uh. So, any other thing? Ah, yes, yes. Uh, right view uh, is the most important. Sotapanna is the most important. That's why uh, you find like the case of Dev Devadatta. He attained all the eight jhanas and he had psychic power. And his psychic power was really good. Uh, so good uh, that the prince Ajata Satu uh, was totally fascinated, taken up by him. Uh. But in spite of that, uh, even though he had all the eight jhanas, uh, because of uh, the ego, uh, he lost all the jhanas and went to hell. Uh, so these states, uh, these states of mental clarity, uh, psychic power and all that, uh, they are not as important uh, as the stages of Aryahood. Stages of the Aryahood, uh, sometimes uh, 
uh, the books, the, the Buddha says uh, there are eight types of Aryans. Uh. In fact, there's a sutta where the Buddha says uh, there are only nine types of beings in the world. Uh. Only nine types of beings in the world. The first one is a putujana. That means an ordinary being, uh, one who is still in the round of rebirths. Uh. And this includes the hell beings, the animals, the ghosts, and most human beings, and most devas. Uh. So, the first is this putu, uh, putuja, ordinary beings. Then, higher than, uh, above that uh, are the eight Aryan stages. Uh. The lowest is the uh, first path attainer. First path attainer. A person attains the first path uh, by entering the stream. Uh, and you enter the stream uh, when you get right view. Uh. And the way to get right view uh, is to listen to the Buddha's Dhamma. When you listen to the Buddha's Dhamma, and you understand the Dhamma, basically the Four Noble Truths, lah, and you understand that the world is impermanent, and because of that, uh, it is unsatisfactory. There's no security uh, in whatever rebirth realm you go to. Even if you go to the heavens, uh, you are there for millions and millions of years. Still, you have to die. And when the Deva dies, uh, he will think, uh, why is my life so short? <laughs> because time... Uh, is relative, you know. There's no such there's no no thing absolute. So uh, that's why uh, learning the suttas, uh, hearing the dhamma is extremely important because that is the way uh, to attaining the first stage of aryahood. And then, according to the suttas, once you attain the first path, uh, it takes some time uh, before it turns to fruit. The fruit is sotapanna. First, uh, first fruit, Arya, is called a Sotapanna. So, a person listens to the Dhamma and understands, uh, so he attains stream entry, he becomes a first path attainer. That's already an Arya. Okay, that's already an Arya. But it takes some time uh, before it turns to fruit. When it turns, when it turns to path, when the path turns to fruit, uh, then the three factors drop away. When the three factors drop away, uh, the three factors, uh, the first one is Sakaya Ditti. Sakaya Ditti uh, is uh, identity view. Uh. If a person has identity view, uh, then he thinks uh, that the body and the mind uh, is the self. Uh. He associates the body and the mind completely with the self. That means he thinks that, that this body or this mind is I, or is mine, belongs to me, or I am inside the body and mind, or the body and mind is inside me. This body and mind are the five aggregates. Body, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. The last four is actually the mind. Okay, So, uh, if a person has eliminated this Sakaya Ditti, then he sees uh, that the body and the mind are ever-changing, impermanent. So he sees uh, that this body and the mind is not the self, but he still has the self uh, somewhere. Uh, he still has the self. Only the Arahan has no self. Uh. So once a person has become uh, Sotapanna, uh, and this path uh, must turn to fruit uh, within that lifetime. Uh, within that lifetime. At the latest, uh, according to Sangyutta Nikaya 25.1, the latest when he dies, uh, when he dies, uh, the path person will become a fruit. Uh. But this is unlike the Abhidhamma. In the Abhidhamma teachings, uh, they say when you attain the path, uh, immediately it becomes fruit, uh, but not in the Sutta. Mm. So, once a person becomes a Sotapanna, he has seven more existences left uh, in the cycle, rebirths, uh, maximum seven. Uh. Uh. So after seven lifetimes, uh, he must enter Nibbana. So you see, uh, it's so important uh, to attain a stream entry. Uh. Once you attain stream entry, uh, you are secure already. You have booked a place in Nibbana already. Uh. It's only a matter of time. Uh. Also, the other characteristic uh, of an Arya is that uh, you will never be reborn into the woeful plains. You will never be reborn as a ghost or an animal or in hell. Uh, but if you have not attained the uh, stream entry, uh, even you attain psychic power like Devadatta, uh, still can go to hell. Uh, that's why it's extremely important to study the, 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 the Dhamma. Uh.
So that is the Sotapanna. Uh, now from Sotapanna to Sakadagamin, how to get the difference between the two, uh, Sotapanna and Sakadagamin. Sakadagamin is the second fruit area. Lah. Second fruit area. The difference uh, is that the Sakadagamin has reduced greed, hatred and delusion. Reduce. Now to reduce greed, hatred and delusion, this greed, hatred and delusion uh, is uh, connected with the five hindrances. Lah. The five hindrances. Uh, the five hindrances are sensual desire, ill will or anger, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry and doubt. Lah. Okay. Pancha Nivarana. So the way to reduce the five hindrances uh, is samadhi. Samadhi. When we attain samadhi, tranquility of mind, calmness of mind, uh, automatically uh, the five hindrances reduce. Uh. So uh, perfect samadhi uh, is called is, is defined as the four jhanas uh, in the in the suttas. Uh. Uh. So if a person reduces uh, greed, hatred, and delusion, uh, so to become a sakadagamin, uh, he has to attain samadhi, uh, which is not perfect. Uh. That means either upachara samadhi, or first jhana, or second jhana, or third jhana. Uh, once he attains any one of these, uh, then uh, he can attain sakadagamin. Uh. Now how to attain the third fruit, anagamin? Anagamin, uh, uh, according to the Buddha, in the Majima Nikaya, uh, you have to have the four jhanas. If you have the four jhanas, uh, the Buddha says that the mind becomes very clear, uh, so clear, uh, that it is uh, it emits light uh, emits light uh, the whole body uh, 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 the, a person with the psychic eye uh, will be able to see the whole body is bright uh, and then the Buddha says when a person attains the fourth jhana he understands all the everything becomes clear to him uh, the mind is so bright uh, that everything becomes clear to him uh, he can understand uh, uh, so such a person with four jhanas, uh, when they listen to uh, a, a, a relevant sutta, uh, for example, the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the Buddha's earliest five disciples, uh, they listen to the Anatta Lakana Sutta and they attain Arahanhut. Uh, so that must you must have that condition of the four jhanas where the mind is so bright uh, and everything is easy to understand. Uh, then with listening of the Dhamma, that listening of the Dhamma is the Vipassana part. The samatha part na, is the samadhi, attaining the jhanas is samatha. And then listening to the suttas is the vipassana, because vipassana means contemplation. Once you listen to the dhamma, uh, the mind contemplates, digests it immediately. Uh. The mind is the fastest, there's nothing faster than the mind in the whole world. Nothing faster than the mind. So once you hear the dhamma, immediately uh, it digests. Uh, and that is the contemplation, the vipassana. That's why you find uh, the earliest uh, disciples of the Buddha, uh, the Buddha went to these external set ascetics uh, who had already the four jhanas, and then sometimes even just spoke one sutta to them, uh, that the jatilas, there were 1,000 method hair ascetics, uh, the Buddha uh, impressed them so much uh, that they shaved off their hair and became followers of the Buddha. And then after that, the Buddha taught them only one sutta, just hearing one sutta, all 1,000 became arahants. Uh, so you see how important the four jhanas are. Uh, so the condition for the anagamin and arahant uh, is four jhanas. Once they have the four jhanas, uh, then they, if they listen enough of the suttas, uh, they will automatically become arahant. Uh. They don't need. Mm, but if you have jhana, it helps. La. <laughs> it helps. Mm. But it's not necessary. Mm. You see, like in the case of our Buddha, uh, the Buddha said in the suttas that in a previous life, uh, he was born as a Brahmin by the name of Jyotipala. This is in the Gatikara Sutta of the Majima Nikaya. Mm. And because he was a Brahmin, uh, he had no desire to see the Buddha. He had no respect for the Buddha. But he had a very good friend who was a pot maker called Gatikara. And this man, Gatikara, brought the Buddha to, at that time, the Bodhisattva, Jyotipala, to see the Buddha Kasapa. And his friend, Gatikara, 
ask the Buddha Kasapa to teach this Jyotipala some Dhamma or compassion. So the Buddha Kasapa spoke the Four Noble Truths to this Brahmin Jyotipala. After hearing the Four Noble Truths, uh, he must have entered the stream. Uh, because uh, after that, uh, he renounced his religion uh, and followed the Buddha, became a monk. So definitely, uh, he must have attained the first uh, uh, stream entry, uh, the first path. Uh. Mm. And during that lifetime under the Buddha Kasapa, when he, he was a monk, uh, he attained at least the first jhana. Because uh, we know that, because the Buddha says, uh, after that lifetime, he was reborn in the Tusita heaven. And from the Tusita heaven, heaven uh, he came down as Siddhartha Gautama. And Siddhartha Gautama, when he was about 10 years old, a uh, small boy, he could enter the first jhana under the Jambu tree. Uh, this was stated in the suttas and the Vinaya. Uh, so that means uh, he must have attained the first jhana under the Buddha Kasapa. And if he had attained the first jhana under the Buddha Kasapa, we can assume uh, that he was a Sakadagamin. Uh, he became a Sakadagamin. That's why it is it is it is uh, evident uh, that uh, a Sakadagamin, uh, when he comes back as a human being, uh, that is his last lifetime. He must enter Nibbana. Uh, that's why even though Siddhartha got, Gautama had such a good uh, life, uh, he came he was born into a rich family. He was young. He had just. Um, had a beautiful wife, etc. He forsook all that. For, he renounced everything uh, to become an ascetic. Uh, that that can only be uh, because he was a Sakadagami. His time for enlightenment was due. So he struggled by himself and attained enlightenment. Uh, okay, I think we can end here uh, tonight.